Nina Mani, my younger judge, you got many men younger, Pulka, no Nari Lester, good no which year have been a Rigney. Um, uh, my colleagues, uh, my friends, uh, it's really uh, an honour to be with you tonight. I just wanted to th uh, thank um, uh, Stuart, Amanda and, um, and Deb uh, for the honour of having me today and uh, I hope that I can fulfil your expectations. Uh, it's uh, as the long standing cultural traditions of the Narunga, um, I'd like to pay honour and respect and um, like to acknowledge all of the um, uh, the fine colleagues that are with us tonight, both black and white, uh, my Indigenous colleagues. Uh, I'm honoured uh, to be amongst you tonight. I also want to acknowledge uh, the unceded uh, gown of sovereignty, which are my community here. Um, uh, I also want to do a, uh, an honouring of um, the colleagues for the feedback for this paper. This, this paper that I'm presenting you today is coming out in the book of Socially Just Education by Robin Garrett, Alison Wrench and uh, Professor Robert Haddam. So that should be out uh, next year. Uh, so you'll find uh, this paper in that. I'd also like to acknowledge Professor John Maynard, uh, Professor James Ladwig, Professor Lyndall Ryan, Associate Professor Linda Wallace, Lindley Wallace, Professor Henry Reynolds for their feedbacks on this paper. Uh, this paper took me about 10 years to write and uh, it's only come to fruition today. So um, I'm honored to rehearse it in front of you. I also would like to acknowledge the 50 year anniversary of AARE. And I just wanted to say, um, I have mixed feelings about this and um, there is something that's not right and some may not know, but despite the hard work of Indigenous SIG and Professor Bunder and Dr Lowe and many others over the years, that over that 50 years, we haven't had a president, Aboriginal president, um, a vice president, a distinguished honour of the, an Aboriginal person delivering the Radford, and nor have we had a distinguished uh, lifetime achievement award. And I'm hoping in the next 50 years of AARE that I live to see the changes. And um, uh, for my part in it, I just wanted to apologise to the current leadership of AARE and Professor Bunder and um, that uh, this has happened on my watch. And I feel as though um, that uh, you've inherited this problem and this wasn't the problem for you to solve the inclusion of Aboriginal people in our much loved AARE should have been mine to fix and others of my ilk and my age. And I just wanted to apologize to the young Indigenous scholars in the audience that, uh, that I have been unable to try and shift that uh, exclusion and that structural barrier. With that said, I know that the current leadership is uh, with uh, Professor um, um, Deb Hayes, President Deb Hayes, the wonderful Bo um, uh, Dr. Bodekin Andrews, the amazing Melita um, Hogarth, Dr. Stuart Riddle, and all their colleagues at the moment, hopefully we'll shift this to a way in which we'll include all knowledges and all scholars. Um, so uh, I want to also say to all the members of the AARE, with all the eloquence that I can muster, even my critics, do what's right, the right way, and the right will be upheld. This isn't a turf war. This is about getting to knowledge that makes Australia a terrific country where all belong. So without further ado, I just want to start. I'm not going to... Um, kill you with the PowerPoint. Uh, I'm just going to read my paper, Educating Aboriginal Children After Massacre, Adorno in Australia. Before and after Australian massacre of Aboriginal children, Australian schools have yet to address two propositions. First is the appalling failure of school for the Aboriginal learner. And second is living up to the promise of democratic education through ethical and political imperatives of never allowing incarcerated brutalization 
witnessed during frontier wars to ever happen again. How do we explain modernity's violent torture of Aboriginal children in Australia's Gulag, the Northern Territory Dondale Detention Centre only five years ago? And the imprisonment of refugee children in offshore detention camps across the Pacific. In this paper, I will argue that without Australian massacre of Aboriginal children, and the public pedagogical practices that brought this into being, Dondale and the stolen generation would not have been possible. Australia has what it takes, in my view, to eradicate school failure for the Aboriginal child. But it must ask itself, what is the place of the child in our society? Is it as future leader, leader or dangerous subject? Depending how we define the child in its present state of modernity, depends also and requires the solutions based upon that definition of whether the child is a problem or whether the child is our future. Given the violent history of massacre of the Aboriginal child, what is the purpose of schooling? With such brutal, brutal history, what does it mean to educate all children on Aboriginal land? Are pedagogies of amnesia fit for purpose for successful debarbarization of the modern Australia? What makes a good teacher of the Aboriginal child? This paper has three moves. Firstly, I will invoke Adorno's concept of the autonomous subject drawn from Kant's ethical theory invoked from his book critique of practical reason and the metaphysicals of morals. Second, I unpack the Tasmanian frontier wars and the evolution of the anti-Aboriginal deficit pedagogy. And third, as a hopeful way forward, I unpack seven cultural responsive provocations as demythologizing pedagogies to ensure promoting learning success so that atrocities against Aboriginal children never happen again. Put simply, my colleagues and friends, I'm seeking new conversations with new dialogues. Possibly it's old wine into new bottles. But I'm seeking a new discourse on the production of new knowledge discourses around the Aboriginal child. I'm also seeking new pedagogies, new pedagogy identities for teachers and children in a modern day era that are fit for purpose. And lastly, I am seeking a new dialogue around the rights of the Aboriginal child to their subjectivities to be intact throughout schooling. These are the objectives that keep me up at night. Drawing on Adorno's essay, uh, Theodore Adorno's essays, which began in 1966 as radio um, talkbacks and eventually was published in 1967, his famous work, Education After Auschwitz, I seek to investigate the role of teacher pedagogy in both memory of Australian violence and how pedagogies do violence to memory. Only recently in Australia has reconciliation and schooling for social transformation emerged as a new part of the global discourse to prevent colonial harm and its regressive tendencies. As you know, the call for decolonizing schools after terrible atrocities aren't new. What is the purpose of schooling in New Zealand after Australia had massacred Muslim uh, uh, worshippers in the mosque in downtown Queenstown. Christchurch, sorry. 
these are the modern day questions and conundrums that face us as social scientists and educational sociologists. However, unlike Australia, the German and South African education systems structurally acknowledge their brutal past. This is in spite of Australian massacres occurring century before Auschwitz. As outlined in ELSIC, the Longitudinal Studies in Indigenous Children, it's about seven years old now, or ELSA, when Aboriginal children are given the opportunity to share Australian, their Australian public schooling experiences, the Aboriginal child brings into view the way educational inequality operates, its enduring deep-seated asymmetries of power, exploitation and assimilationist pedagogies. All children are intelligent and have citizenry rights at birth. And if these rights of the child are not met by the nation state, then the child is not the problem. Instead, we have a problem with democracy. Aboriginal children are experts of their own life worlds. Research shows that a misrepresentation of their skills, abilities, and cultural and linguistic intelligences contributes to the lack of school delivery for their democratic rights. Normative notions of white identities projected onto the Aboriginal child constrain their abilities and aspirations to reach their full potential. Despite Australian massacres occurring centuries before Auschwitz, Education After Auschwitz by Theodore Adorno and the paper, What Might Education Mean After Abu Ghraib by Henry Giraud, both place a demand upon the teacher and pedagogy to educate society against denial. So Auschwitz never happens again. For Adorno, educating from racism and denial into equality is a collective task of democratic societies and is left to education of mature citizens to enact this right. Yet the present appalling statistics of Aboriginal youth suicide, child incarceration says reveals deep denials about the past and its failed pedagogical project of the present. In the paper, I'm examining the possibilities of schooling for schools and social transformation, given the unacknowledged silence of the Australian massacre and its effect on the disengaged Aboriginal child in schooling. I consider the foundations of power relations on the Aboriginal learner and its impact on its self-determined agency within the Australian classroom as a product of poor non-fit for purpose pedagogy. I define in this paper the need to move towards more culturally responsive pedagogies that has the effect of lifting Aboriginal results and keeping intact their rights to their subjectivity. But I'm arguing that to understand the world, you must First, understand a place like Australia. Australia houses the oldest child in the world, the oldest living civilization in the world. Some of the rock art in, uh, in Western Australia up in the Kimberley houses some of the first images of um, by a child uh, ever across the history of the globe. This is an ancient country. In his book, Courier Will to Win, The Resistance of Survival of Black Australia, James Miller argues Australia is the largest nation in the Pacific and is the jewel of the British colonialism used to control the region by treating people less than human. For Miller, colonization entailed control of the country and the Pacific by brutal force then followed by public pedagogies that both frame and mediate authoritarian meanings into benevolent democracy. These technologies of pedagogy have serious consequences for the Aboriginal child, its voice and agency. Like Miller, recent Indigenous scholars like Hogarth, Bond, Fredericks, Bargaley, Carlson, all call into question 
racialized public pedagogy practices aligned and shaped by larger institutional and cultural discourses. Similarly, agency as defined by indigenous scholars, including Bunda, Rose, Sarah, Karen Sinclair and Gary Thomas, requires shifting anti-Aboriginal pedagogy as public ritual, the conditions that produce them and its collusion with Western reason. Without Australian massacre, it is in, I am advocating, without Australian massacre of Aboriginal children, anti-Aboriginal pedagogies, youth brutality at Dondale and the treatment of stolen generations children just simply wouldn't have been possible. The Black War in Tasmania occurred in 1823 to 1834. According to leading historian of, the, of Australian massacres, Professor Lyndall Ryan, the Black War in Tasmania is widely held by historians as one of the best documented of all Australian colonial frontier wars. Yet the facts are still denied and claims disputed. In 1804, the massacre at the Risdon Cove settlement involved the deaths of probably about 50 members of an Aboriginal group fired upon by settlers and soldiers, with the majority of them women and children. Settler forces attempted to corral Tasmanian Aboriginal peoples that led to the famous, infamous Black Line Ryan explains. The Black Line in 1830 in Van Diemen's land as the colony of Tasmania was known then, was the largest force ever to assemble against Aborigines anywhere in Australia. Compromising more than 2000 soldiers and civilians and widely to believe to, believe, to be the brainchild of colonial governor George Arthur. Its purpose was to drive four of the nine Tasmanian Aboriginal nations from their homelands to another part of the island and bring an end to the Black War or the Guerrilla War that occurred 30, for 30 years before, the, uh, before this war. However, when the line ended, eight weeks later, only two Tasmanian Aboriginal people were reported captured and two others reported killed. 2,700 white men were used, 1,000 stands of arms, 30,000 rounds of ammunition, and 300 sets of handcuffs. Highly effective guerrilla war tactics were taken up by Tasmanian Aboriginal nations of Oyster Cove, Big River, North Midlands, and Ben Lomond. In describing the indigenous settler conflict in Tasmania as gruesome and systematic, Ryan draws on school teacher, our colleague, James Bonwick accounts published in what he wrote, the last, Tas the last of the Tasmanians in 1870. His teacher accounts collected from colonists highlighted 16 instances of massacre with a combined loss of at least 300 Aboriginal lives, three quarters of those children. While the attempted extermination by 2000 soldiers were unsuccessful, Ryan concludes that the Black Line was not an aberration of an autocratic British governor, British governor in the remote past. Rather, she claims that the Black Line demonstrated such a brutal colonizing force and systems was a normal part of the British imperial policy at the time and more clearly connected with the fate of indigenous peoples in other parts of the empire. While academics continue to, in the discipline of history, continue to engage in revisionist movements to produce counter narratives to settler accounts, the discipline of education in Australia has been slow to investigate the role and motivations of schools in epistemicide. That is the killing of knowledge systems. D'Souza Santos defines epistemicide as many alternative knowledges and sciences have been destroyed and the social groups that use these systems to support their autonomous path of development have been humiliated. In short, he says, 
in the name of science, epistemicide has been committed and the imperial powers have resorted to it to disarm any resistance of the conquered peoples and social groups, end quote. In the Australian context, as I have argued elsewhere, that colonialism, epistemicide and racialized eccentric Eurocentric reason are the past structural means that exclude school epistemologies and ontologies of today's Aboriginal learner. Throughout much history, massacre and epistemicide were largely unspoken of and forgotten, including those of Mile Creek Massacre in 1838, the Coniston Massacre of 1928, so much so that in 1968, eminent anthropologist W.E.H. Stanner in his Boyer lectures challenged educational academics, historians and governments for what he called the Great Australian Silence. He argued that the system that led to a cult of forgetfulness towards Aboriginal peoples contributed to a long-standing denial of colonial frontier conflict, violent and dispossession. It was, he proclaimed, I quote, a structural matter, a view from a window which has been carefully placed to exclude a whole quadrant of the landscape. What may well have begun as a simple forgetting of other possible views turned under habit and over time into something like a cult of forgetfulness practiced on a national scale. Atwood argues that settler societies like Australia find it difficult to acknowledge their brutal past and that the denial form of forgetfulness was a crucial factor in creating the nation. Whilst while national identity is born from mythical claims born of imperfect pedagogy, the foundational narrative that uh, James Cook using terra nullius, the land belonging to no one, challenges the notion that black massacres ever occurred. The narrative of white convict gulags also little understood but embraced over black atrocity. The understanding of imprisoning white um, uh, uh, convicts for stealing bread in Tasmania is a far more localized memory than those of the massacre of Aboriginal children. Informed by all forms of butchery, Australia would advance nuclear technologies towards unspeakable human horror. In 1952, the Arnhemu Aboriginal peoples in South Australia were forced from their land so Australia and Britain could test atomic bombs with the aim to massacre millions with a single cost effect detonation. Cumbersome colonial methods of killing whole populations using black line theory as advocated by Governor Arthur was too cost inefficient. The Australian and British could test atomic bombs with the aim to massacre millions with a single cost effective detonation. Cumbersome colonial methods of killing whole populations advance towards efficient human elimination. In my view, the massacre of innocent Aboriginal nations, the killings that occurred by atomic bombs, belong in the same historical period as genocide. Yet compellingly, the preservation of Stanner's cult of forgetfulness within a liberal democracy by the civilized ruling leadership was its precondition. Distinguished historian Henry Reynolds stresses that by the time Stanner spoke of the cultural, the cult of forgetfulness, historians were busy engaging in research to transform the colonial silences. The educational discipline has yet to understand the key pedagogies that drove to the cult of forgetfulness. Today, Australia has wide interest in the fierce academic debates of the history wars. But the, the same can't be said in the pedagogical wars. In light of these events, the question remains why for the most part of Australian history, didn't the discipline of archeology span 
with its tools to produce evidence of human extermination, exposed the widespread cover-up that could assist education in making pedagogical change. Surely, the dead, um, pushing dead underneath the carpets could have been dug up using bone analysis so that writing pedagogies could have been taught in schools of what actually happened instead of the pedagogies of amnesia dominating curricula. Rightly so, Prof Associate Professor Lindley Wallace and her colleagues in their paper looking for the proverbial needle the archaeology of the Australian colonial frontier outlines why evidence of a forensically acceptable level is unlikely to pres be preserved archaeologically. They go on to claim that the massacre site identification, because of perpetrator concealment, require multidisciplinary agents to understand life during the frontier wars, language loss, epistemicide, police records, ration outposts, colonial archives, fortified architecture. In their view, they're suggesting a multidisciplinary approach to unveiling what had happened to the past in order to get to a pedagogy of possibility for the future. Education has to play a role. I concur with Wallace and argue knowledge and its colonial transmission via school reproduces amnesia and denialism, without which forgetting massacre on a grand scale would hardly have been possible. As I claim above, the discipline of education is not innocent in its role in dispossession, coercion, and the fixing of settler reason to truth. However, it has made progress over the time, I argue, towards inclusive practices and has a national curriculum to improve disparities. Not a simple task without complex and challenge. We must never forget that the colonial education system produced a certain type of uneducated person to both forget massacre, yet keep in place its white superiority rhetoric, along with the regressive tendencies for totalitarianism under democracy. What massacre produced, according to what Adorno calls blind identification with the collectiveness? for a reified consciousness blinded to historical past. Spring forward to 2008, Australia apologises to the stolen generation for the removal of children from their parents. It acknowledges the brutality of the colonial historical project and its pedagogical solution. Eight years after the national apology, Australia's gulag of shame, Domdale, presents itself. It's exposed by the ABC Four Corners program, mistreatment, tear gassing, torture of children, vile footage to emerge of the Aboriginal youth, Dylan Volley, legs shackled, which produced seven different United Nations reports against Australia's human rights violations. He was cruelly strapped to a medieval structure with a black mask in Abu Ghraib style the horror of Australia's authoritarian regression became visible over again, repeated by a broken system and failed policy that reifies a school to prison pathway of its own choosing. Lorena Alarm, journalist for The Guardian, claimed that despite three years on from the 2017 Royal Commission into Dondale, all children criminally imprisoned in the Northern Territory are Aboriginal. This statistic hasn't changed since 2017. The National Apology called for never again stolen generation and mistreatment. However, systems of state violence against Aboriginal children shaped by old rules were viewed as a relapse into humane, in, inhumane treatment of the past. Have the conditions that made historical violence towards Aboriginal ch children possible continued largely unchanged? Is the question that we as educationists and our pedagogies of choice have to ask? 
Such questions extend beyond the events of the stolen gener uh, generation in Dondale, yet they provide us as educators an opportunity to connect to the violent treatment of children and the task to redefining pedagogy, an opportunity to connect with redefining pedagogies as culturally responsive rather than deficit and anti-Aboriginal. If pedagogical transformation of education and society has been stifled by violent colonialism, what is the role of schooling after massacre? Theodore Adorno published the famous essay, Education After Auschwitz, where he begins to question that, um, that questions about Auschwitz have largely escaped society's consciousness and the economic and social conditions that made the Holocaust possible have not diminished post-war. For fear of its occurrence, Adorno argued that the systems and the structures that led to the atrocity of human extermination must be made visible to all to see. For Adorno, schooling has two purposes after massacre, collectivization and understanding how, um, uh, how um, the system worked to produce collective denial and then its solution of the autonomous subject. And in the autonomous subject, um, uh, he's clearly borrowing from his work with Horkheimer uh, around the notion of um, uh, the uh, d emancipatory di dialectic. <clears throat> and what we're seeing here is um, the dialectic of enlightenment, which Horkheimer and Adorno wrote, explored why mankind, instead of entering into a truly human condition, has now starting to sink into human barbarism. For, for Horkheimer and Adorno, modernity was far from redeeming the promises and hopes of the enlightenment and it had fallen into the very rationality that was to be its liberation. Adorno and Horkheimer's dialectic of enlightenment explored and exposed the domination and violence that underpinned the enlightenment project itself. They argued, if the human condition is mutilated, consciousness is reflected back upon the body and the sphere of corporal unfree will tend towards violence. What pedagogies might enable public to foreground the codes and structures which give pedagogies their meaning while also connecting agency to public discourses? How is Australia's massacres understood as a part of a broader debate about how the way dominant knowledge production works, how it's transmitted in schools, how it emphasizes that success is success by the accumulation of whiteness and the grasp of the Aboriginal child of the settler grammar. And therefore, the success is also defined as the projection of whiteness onto the black child's identity. How do we understand the Australian massacre and the pedagogical conditions that produced it? without engaging in the discourses of how schooling might want to oppose the view towards more of a self-determination agenda. What kinds of educational pro practices can provide the conditions for a cultural questioning? I am suggesting that Australia is without a culturally responsive pedagogy. And um, when what's on the table for teachers to improve the logics of Aboriginal education, um, the, there are only four pedagogies that seem to be on offer that are pure failure. The first failure, if a teacher wants to go to address the Aboriginal child and the schooling failure for it, they are left with direct instruction, Aboriginal perspectives across the curriculum, cultural competency and anti-racism. The history of Australia 
suggests that all of these have failed and that we need a new discourse. And I'm suggesting culturally responsive pedagogies. When you go to um, uh, hopeful pedagogies around the world and you look at places of hope, such as North America, South America, Central America, the Pacific and Canada, there's culturally responsive pedagogies as a hopeful idea progressing quite strongly. When you look at and you um, uh, investigate the Australian context of Australian cultural responsive pedagogies, you find very little other than Cracker's terrific work, Jacinta Cracker's and others. Um, but Professor Hadam and I out of our ARC um, discovery grant, a three year longitudinal research have just published the cutting edge literature review that everyone could now access online. So if we have these failed pedagogies, the, the APAC, the um, cultural competencies, the anti-racism, direct instruction, we know that these are imperfect and alone they're not going to give us any relief. Let me rehearse then the seven key cultural responsive principles that I'm provocating. The first is the first is is that Aboriginal epistemologies must be constantly in dialogue with non-Indigenous epistemologies and ontologies, and that the school and the teacher cannot engage or invoke onto epistemic identities that the child is walk, that is walking into classroom with just on NAIDOC week or um, reconciliation week or using this as just the cultural celebrations. If a cultural responsive pedagogy is to be of its worth, it has to in constant 24 hours, eight hours of school, bring into constant dialogue the cultural and linguistic repertoire and intelligences that the child is bringing to school with those of local and global knowledges so that the child can not only um, uh, be successful in learning but also leave in schooling intact with their identity of being Aboriginal. The second provo provo provocation that I'm suggesting for a cultural responsibility, uh, res responsive pedagogy is for Aboriginal children to be Aboriginal. The third proposi proposition for understanding um, a culturally responsive pedagogy is to understand that Australian history was not massacre, but war. To demythologize de Australian atrocities, the teacher must be clear that the frontier wars were wars and that these wars are not a history of massacre. And indeed, there were new innumerable massacres, but a teaching approach that privileging the massacre narrative incorrectly ascribes to First Nations people a lack of agency and passivity that didn't exist in the face of the colonial expansion. My fifth proposition is that critical place-based studies are important, local, actualizing local knowledges and connecting them to learning and the national curriculum is a critical point that the teacher engages in a culturally responsive pedagogy. The next proposition is reconceptualizing the image of the Aboriginal learner as competent and capable subject. Now, massacres construct Aboriginal people as feeble, needy and without humanity. The, a cultural response of demythologizing the colonial image of the Aboriginal child as deficit, homogenous and incompetent. <clears throat> 
And at this point, I think there is a need for education to move beyond the concept of Aboriginal and move back to more localised identities. There is no such thing as an, a language that is called Aboriginal. There is no nation called Aboriginal, just as there's no nation called Asia and there is no language titled Asia. Uh, the next proposition is that a cultural response of pedagogies are built and mine for the cultural and linguistic intelligences brought from home to the classroom and links that to learning and has high um, intellectual challenge and just doesn't do crap to the child. It enters into a dialogue with the child and moves beyond transmissive mission pedagogies. Lastly, a cultural response of pedagogy must bring solidarity in collectivism for change to the societal condition. My colleagues, I hope that I have, in uh, the brevity, have given you a sense of my thinking and the challenges that keep me awake for a brighter future for all children in this country. The history of um, the history of uh, Aboriginalness and the history of massacre is one that we must face. In conclusion, if the purpose of schooling after massacre is the accumulation of whiteness and the settler grammar, and that this is shone as success, then the consequences of failure in Australia's new colonialism as neoliberalism, the consequences for that is more child prison, more poverty, and a school to prison pathway. This should not be the next 50 years of study for AARE. This should be now. Thank you very much.